Hatem. Ali. When someone mentions uh, mental health to you, what comes to your mind? Honestly speaking, when someone says mental health, uh, he and Aman, the first thing that comes to your mind is Ibn Sina Hospital. Oh, <laughs> why that? They, the, the people who have gone cuckoo. That's oh. the only thing that comes to mind. Is there anything more than uh, this the, in mental health? Does it mean oh. another thing? Definitely, it, needs, it means a lot, man. You're missing a lot. You want well, to find out. Well, educate me. <laughs> All right. Yes, I want to find out. We'll come back then. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you, my brother? I'm good. How are you doing? And welcome to Chat Away in Ummati Station. How is everybody doing? How is all our followers? Can I hear you? I think, Can uh, I hear yes? No, I can't. Hear well, you, you will hear them through chat. Then do not forget to please comment and put all your questions there so we can have an answer to them. And even if you just want to say Assalamu Alaikum and hi, that's fine. So, you know, Ali, Ali, you know, what I like about our show is the diversity and uh, that, uh, you know, we keep on inviting people who are very special and mm. who uh, tend to educate us in uh, different fields. So yeah. I think we get to learn as well. And that's why we that's the purpose of the show. Mm-hmm. And today we have a special guest. Who do we have uh, today on the show? Okay, let me introduce our guest for today. So our guest for today is Dr. Hamida Al-Harthi. Hamida Al-Harthi has been working in mental health nursing field for more than 20 years as staff nurse. She had experience working in all <laughs> subspecialty of mental health. She had witnessed most of mental health developments in Oman as an Omani nurse. She then moved to That's academic field from 2006, where she taught mental health nursing students. There were more than 10 cohorts which graduated under her supervision. So let us welcome Dr. Hamida Al-Harthi. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Alaikum salam wa barakatuh. Alaikum salam, Ali. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. I thank Allah for everything. And uh, I thank you, Sheikh Hatim, for inviting me today for, in this show. I thank you, Ali, also to do all the job. And uh, actually, I would like to put a word about uh, Sheikh Hatim. Sheikh Hatim, I have known him for quite a long time. And uh, we, I had a chance to work with him closely in those 10 years, which I, you have mentioned. 10 years. <laughs> MashaAllah. Yeah. MashaAllah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I yeah, thought you were Sheikh talking Hat- about one year, one or two years, 10 years. Mashallah. No, no, 10 years, yes, I can say that. Because Sheikh Mashallah. Hatim actually, we used to consider him as the source of inspiration of our, to our students, to us ourselves, exactly. to our audience. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, exactly. I can say that um, uh, in these 10 years, we have conducted a, you know, a huge event. Uh, uh, each year we had uh, like a, a different uh, theme and different topic and uh, that was uh, like a project which a student have uh, supposed to do for their graduation. So we used to call uh, in that uh, that event like 400 to 500 people and uh, Sheikh Hatim was one of the most wanted, you know, guest speaker because Mashallah. most of the people they used even to ask because whenever we used to call him the, uh-huh. this year, the coming year when we used to call the, the audience, they used to ask us, is that uh, Sheikh coming? And we used to say, yeah, he's coming. So, yeah, okay, okay, I'm going to register. <laughs> so, mashallah, we have learned a lot from you, Sheikh Hatim. We'd like to thank you. And our students have learned really a lot from you. And I think some of them, they have even followed your path. Even. <laughs> so, in those 10 years, we have done a great job. You're looking at one of them. You're looking at one of them, one of the followers. Oh, mashallah. So I'm right with whatever I'm saying. Yeah? <laughs> you know, Ali, le, Ali, let me tell you a funny story. One day, yeah. uh, the institution that uh, Dr. Hamid is working invited me for a talk. It, mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember this, uh, Dr. Hamid, but it was a graduation 
for midwives. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they asked me to say something in this graduation. And mm -hmm. I, I had no idea what to talk about for a graduation of midwives because <laughs> I'm not a woman. I never gave birth and I don't assist women to give birth. So it was a very challenging talk that I had. But it is one of the uh, one of the best talks that I ever had uh, in front of an audience because the night before I went uh, to my wife and I called up my sisters and I asked them a strange strange question and I asked them how does it feel to to deliver a baby and they looked at me like what what sort of question is this Mm. And then I we we chat for some some time and I got some information what it feels like to give a baby, and that was the topic of uh, my uh, my speech uh, for the graduation ceremony. So thank you very much, Dr. Hamida, to invite me uh, throughout the past ten years, and we are honored to have you today. But today is not about me; it's about you and uh, you. mental health. So I'm sure. We hear this this terminology a lot when yeah. it comes to mental health. We hear mental health, mental health, and uh, there are a lot of people propagating mental health now. But mm -hmm. I'm sure there is a misconception in the society when it comes to mental health. So tell us your journey from the beginning. How did you get into this field in the beginning? As a nurse, oh. why did you choose mental uh, health? B before you answer that question, let me just mm -hmm. clarify one thing to uh, one of our viewers here. Uh, his name is Bilal yeah. Al Afriqi. Uh, he says, uh, "Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh." Brothers, please be careful of the language you use. Calling people who are mentally ill cuckoo is not funny to them. Uh, I just want to tell to brother uh, Bilal, thank you for that. Uh, uh, but we were yes, actually doing you. an act. Uh, at all, 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 almost all in our shows at the beginning, we do some kind of an act. So the act was not really done, uh, or, or that word that uh, Hatim used, cuckoo, was not said by Hatim himself, but he was acting what other people were saying. Yes. So yeah, we're aware of that. But, but thank you, thank you for telling us. But that. we we do apologize. We do apologize. We didn't mean to insult uh, anyone. It's just. Uh, uh, it's part of the act, and inshallah, we will not do yeah. it again. Don't you? So go ahead, yes, Dr. Dr. Ahmed. Okay, so you have, if I have to say about my journey, <laughs> you know, into, into mental health, that actually it's a strange journey because uh, that was not my favor at all. So when I started, uh, when I graduated in, nurse, in nursing. That time, you know, I was too young, and you know, I was so enthusiastic. I wanted to walk somewhere where there is, you know, you know, I can see the traumas, and I can handle a lot of tasks, and I can do a lot of things. Then I joined Hola Hospital. Uh, uh, Alhamdulillah, that place I worked as, uh, you know, in ER. And then I worked in uh, a main operation theater. I worked in uh, with the children also. But later on, I came to know that. Um, Emotionally, I'm too fragile to handle seeing people dying, especially my patients. So I, you know, it literally it was like every day whenever a patient dies, I go home and cry. <laughs> so I thought, yeah, I found myself that I'm really not suitable to work in a, in a trauma hospital. And um, I tried to think, I tried uh, to think, and uh, where am I going? Because uh, what am I doing? Because I'm not doing any good to my patients if, if, if I'm going to be emotionally hooked with their uh, diseases and you know if I see death then you know I'm not myself and I cannot handle that then I, I thought like no I have to change my profession later on I started thinking about going to Ibn Sina I chose Ibn Sina you have mentioned Ibn Sina hospital Ibn Sina hospital is the yes. hospital which was open at that time for psychiatric patients and it was mm -hmm. located near to my house so I thought like you know and you know as a young mom and you know let me move to this hospital but I, my passion was not at all mental health. Then I said, okay, let me give it a try and see how it goes. When I moved to Ibn Sina Hospital, believe me, within the first year only, I fall in love with the mental health. You know, I really found myself there. I found myself that I can do more, more, more than what I, I was expecting to do. Because, you know, uh, seeing mentally ill patients and helping them, you know, seeing the way they come, 
in, uh, you know, they are totally out of uh, reality, disoriented. They don't know where they are. They don't know what they are doing and things, you know, where, and how we, we deal with them and how we treat them. And later on, when they come out of the hospital, how they are, that was an amazing job. I thought, no, this is what I want, really, and this is what I want to do. And since then, I'm really in love with mental health, you know. So <laughs> I was one of the nurses, few nurses which were working at that time in uh, Ibn Sina Hospital, because at that particular time, mental health was really stigmatized in Oman, you know. And people were, you know, many people were not having at all awareness about mental health. They were not believing that, you know, there is you know, uh, a doctor which can, can, could help people who, who are having mentally ill you know, issues, because to them, they were believing that, you know, uh, their patient or their loved one, they are possessed by jinn. So they used to yeah. take their, their people to the, you know, black magician or whatever it is. And then lay after, until the patient is alas, already at the late stage, then that time they will realize, you know, they have to take him to Ibn Sina. So... Uh, the profession itself, it was stigmatized, but uh, later on, you know, with the mental health awareness, you know, and, and, you know, a lot of developments happened in the country, and then we were able to change this uh, misconception of the people about mental health. Yeah. So this is, in, you know, in simple, in simple law, this is, was my journey in mental health. <laughs> so I think, I think when uh, people used to hear uh, Ibn Sina uh, yeah. here in, in Oman, always uh, that it comes in their mind you know the the type of people that who are there and then they try to be all protective even to to visit that place so if you, maybe if you can tell us a little bit about the mental health issues in in an omani community and and also but before you do that uh, let us uh, maybe if you can talk about the reactions of of the omanis uh, who has been there in um, in, in uh, ibn sina as opposed to those who haven't been there. And I'm talking about the visitors mainly, not, not the sick ones. But, uh, it, as I mentioned, you know, the profession itself, it was stigmatized by both community and the, and, you know, and the, and the patients, mm. and the professions, okay? So, uh, you know, as I said, you know, mental health is, is the same anywhere in the world. A patient who is having schizophrenia is the same patient who will be having schizophrenia somewhere else. The symptoms will be the same, but it's the way the people in the community, how they understand that and how, and how they take it. Yeah. So here in Oman, I can say, you know, most of the people, most of, uh, misconception was like these people, they are not having real disease. It's a possession by the gene. So they, should, they used to go to the black magician and they used to do a lot of things, you know, which was not really... Uh, related to the mental health as you know as a you know something that you know uh, people could seek help or they could have uh, you know take uh, to take medicine or you know to be admitted in the hospital so that was like uh, if someone is admitted in the hospital believe me sometimes they will say no one even will come and visit their patient because they they were afraid that they would be stigmatized if the community will come to know that they have one of their patients in the hospital. So mm. it went on for quite a long time until, you know, maybe I can say early 2000, that is the time that, you know, mental health were, uh, when I was able to find their way and, you know, people were talking uh, very much about the, uh, uh, you know, the mental health development and then, you know, what is the mental, what is mental illness is, what are the, the help, where to seek help, and then people, uh, they realize later that, you know, there is a, a hospital and there is a, a profession that's called mental health or mental health services in Oman. But uh, it was a stigma. It was like, uh, mm. I can say, compared to other hospitals, the visitors were very minimal, okay? People were coming, if, uh, if a, a, a family has a mental ill patient, they used to hide them. They used especially if it is a female patient, you know, so they used to hide them. They were not even talking to the neighbors if they have like a, a problem uh, of, uh, or, a, or you know, any member who is having mental ill at home uh, to avoid the stigma. But, but when did this awareness happen? When in, in Oman, I'm talking about Oman. Was yeah, it I, I, yeah. Just recently or long time ago? No, maybe early tw uh, tw uh, this one, uh, 20s. So it was like uh, before 19, 1990s, 
there's still there was still like misconception of what mental health because that time it was only been seen a hospital running uh, mental health services for the whole Oman and we were having I think Salala they were having just a small ward which they were they used to admit mental ill patients so the majority of patients used to come to Ibn Sina hospital and actually it was a small hospital the bed capacity was like 80 80 beds because mm. again what I said families they were not uh, you know they were not having that insight that you know there is the mental health services that could help their people so most of the time they used to keep their patients at home sometimes they chain them sometimes you know they take to this black magician okay you okay, can keep him inside don't let him go outside so most of the time they were treat, dealing with their mentally ill people at home rather than bringing them to the hospital but uh, as i you know as i mentioned you know when we started uh, you know working into uh, 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 in a hospital you know even many nurses were not even uh, their family were not even allowing the nurses to come and work in the, in the hospital so but later on, they started changing that misconception. You know, many Omani, Omani nurses started joining the hospital. And then we started, you know, com, uh, co conducting like uh, awareness, going to public, going to the community to talk about mental health. So that is the time that people rea they come to realize that there is a mental health services that could help their people. And majority of people, you know, uh, they started bringing their patient. Even we were even running uh, out of bed when they realized that, you know. There is somewhere where they can seek help. Yeah. Dr. Hamid, uh, when it comes to mental health, there are people with uh, who are born with issues with mental health, and there are people who live normal lives and then suddenly, uh, out of stress or other issues, uh, they develop mental health. Uh, in terms of Oman and the region, what are the common types of mental health illnesses that people go through? Well, you know, as um, schizophrenia and uh, most of psychotic disorders, uh, actually, we I have witnessed in the in the hospital, are because sometimes you know there is the literature say that you know if a mother and a father are psychotic, there is a big chance that you know the children could get could could get any psychotic illnesses like a schizophrenia or bipolar or any other psychotic illnesses. So. Oman is one of the countries that, you know, we have that uh, you know, close relative marriage. So sometimes yes. if there is a, a family member who is like a schizophrenia, they tend, okay, let, let, let her get married to her cousin, okay, and she will be fine. So that was the misconception that, you know, mm -hmm. if there is someone who is ill, maybe the marriage will cure him. And who is the closest person is the cousin, okay? So they used to let, you know, people get married uh, regardless if the, of their illness. So most of the time you'll find that their children, there is a big chance that their children will develop uh, uh, psychiatric illnesses. So um, psychos psychosis and psychiatric, uh, this one, um, uh, yeah, psych psychosis were the more, most common illnesses which were witnessed, I, was, I, I have witnessed in the hospital. Uh, all the schizophrenia and the, the types of schizophrenia, it's really very, very common. And even some some of the people, you know, they, uh, because it start it starting in the early age, the prognosis was very very poor. Okay, even children I have noticed children who have uh, schizophrenia. Again, maybe if you if you read their profile, you'll find that the father or the mother was suffering from either uh, psychotic uh, illnesses before him. Uh, can you tell us some of the experiences that you've gone through with patients? I don't know if uh, if you can tell us even stories. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> You know, I, uh, I have witnessed a lot, a lot of uh, stories, and you know, because uh, literally, literally, I have worked in each and every department in Ibn Sina Hospital. I have worked in, with adults, with children, with male ward, you know, as a triage nurse. So I have witnessed a lot of things. And um, I don't know if I can tell up to tomorrow, maybe I'm not finished, but uh, I will try to choose some of the cases which really I w it was like, you know, um, the, the, the cases that that touched that touched you yeah, yeah that have touched me uh the the most of the uh, most of the time where i uh, you know the patient was brought to the hospital he's uh, fully disoriented of the time and he doesn't know where he is sometimes they brought him handcuffed and you know he will be in a very you know terrible uh, condition so we used to, to uh, tranquilize him put give him injection and 
put him in the seclusion room for how many days, you know, he will say maybe at least for one month without him coming back to the reality. And once the patient is khalas, and mashallah, he started and get the treatment and, you know, and uh, realizing where he is and he's starting asking about his family. Can you imagine Sheikh Hatim, one of the most questions a patient used to ask is, sister, how many days did I stay here in the hospital? And I used to say, for example, okay, you have been here for, for a month. And then she used to count, okay, so I have to pray all these months which I have missed, uh, all these days which I have missed. Uh, subhanallah. Come, come on, subhanallah. I said, no, you don't have to do that. You, you, you don't have mm. to do this. You, you, no, 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 sister, I have to do that. I have to, I have to pray. And if it was Ramadan, they will ask you also, how many days did I, you know, I miss? Mm. Then it was itself, it was, to me, it was, I started realizing, come on, we are healthy people. And sometimes you miss Salah and sometimes you don't, I don't know, have a lot of issues that you, you know, goes around. Maybe you, you, you know, you're not praying, but see this particular person, you know, he was out of reality. She was out of reality. And now she's asking you, how many days did I, you know, I, <laughs> I didn't Amen. pray. And she uh, compensate that prayers, which she didn't pray. So that was right. one of the most thing which were really touched me and I started you know searching what is my prayer mat so I will pray. <laughs> I, really I think uh, Doctor this is uh, very inspirational and it teaches yeah. us a lesson that uh, exactly. no one has a has an excuse not to pray. You know That's if all. they can if, if they can if they can pray and they're concerned about prayer what about yeah. everybody else who have, yeah. you know, ex yeah. excuses not to pray because they're lazy exactly. or they're tired or exactly. they don't feel like praying? I think yeah. that's a very big lesson and you have chosen the best story to, yeah. to tell us. Uh, you know, she, thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I can say that she literally <laughs> taught me something because that time I was too young. And, you know, sometimes if you are too young, then you are busy with a lot of things. So she gave me a lesson of life. I can thank her up to tomorrow because she made me realize, no, you have really, you know, with whatever, how, how much uh, how you get busy in, the, in this world, you have to remember that your creator is there. So you have to remember that you have to fulfill that, you know, you know your prayers and do whatever you're supposed to do. <laughs> how, uh, how, how do you convince uh, the community and parents that, uh, you know, what your child or your relative is going through is an issue of mental health and it is not uh, the common understanding that the society have like uh, jinn or black magic or other, uh, other, other, other supernatural issues. How do you explain to them? How do you make them understand? And do they get convinced? Because I understand that sometimes uh, in a lot of communities, they get attached so much to these beliefs that they don't listen to the professionals when it comes to mental health. So tell us a little bit about that, uh, Dr. Rahamila. Yeah, actually in doing that, we had a really challenging time because we have to reach community as much as we can. So we used to, for example, we used to not to target only the people who are having people who are having mental Ill, uh, issues, uh, mental mental health issues. We used to target everybody, so we wanted like everybody to understand what is mental health. So in order to do that, we used to go to the community. So we used to go to the health centers where people where while people are waiting for to to see their doctor, their doctor. We used to take like pamphlets and we used to go there and talk to them in Arabic, and to you know we used to have like. Um, a campaign, okay? We go to the malls, we go to the com community, we go to anywhere that we get, and you know, a group of people who are uh, together in order to, uh, in, you know, increase awareness in mental health. So we were using that like a simple language, direct language, okay? So we we were not using really the scientific words because they will not really understand what, if you say like schizophrenia, if you say delusion, they will not understand what is delusion. So we used to use like a simple word that they can understand and on, on the same time they can even ask question about it. So for example, we ask them about what do you see in your, in your, in your child? For example, if a child is having schizophrenia, so if he, she, he, she, the child is denying that you are his father, so is that right to you? What do you think about that? Because one of the most uh, 
common symptoms in, in uh, this one psychotic illnesses or schizophrenia it's like uh, delusions so some, most of the cases used to come like they have the delusions they you know they deny that this this is their father this is their father or this is their mom or they were hearing things they were seeing things so we used to tell them to, so uh, what do you understand so what do you think about delusion we, do, we didn't use the term delusion as delusion but we used to put it in a simple language that you know their belief is strange to you so what do we think about this so okay they will say okay yeah yeah for example a father who was describing his son uh, and he was telling that you know uh, i started realizing that my son is not well because while we, i was driving with him in the car he started saying that there is something which is implanted in, the, in their car and that's uh, I, I don't know a camera or whatever it is it is really uh, you know following him and the people they are uh, tracking him they want to kill him mm. the father he believed that time because somehow he said maybe maybe there is something maybe he has a friend or something like that yes then he took the whole car to the to the service you know to the car service and he tell them you know please can you check inside the car what and he was uh, literally standing there while the while the people are doing this thing they you know checking the car he wanted himself to make sure that there is no nothing in the car but uh, at the beginning he believed his son that there is something in the car when he he realizes that you know that there is the there is nothing in the car then he started thinking that you know uh, uh, there is gin maybe someone has mm. ch- has sent gin to his son and the son, that's why the son is saying that there is a camera in the in the car mm. but uh, later on uh, the, you know the, the 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 child started you know even exhibiting more more uh, mental uh, this one mental uh, illness symptoms he started denying that this is the father to him he started saying that you know he's the his father is the Khomeini, that time Khomeini was, was alive, I think, yeah. That is, uh, yes. his father is Khomeini, he's not his father. Oh. The father is trying to get closer to him, and his, the child was totally avoiding him. He packed he, his uh, bag, and he wanted to go away following his father. And then the father started realizing, no, this is not, not it's, it's not Jin, it's not, you know, there is something wrong with the child. So when we started explaining, and this, subhanAllah, when we uh, we met this uh, particular person, he was in the health center taking his, his uh, treatment, you know, diabetic treatment, whatever treatment. So when we started explaining to the audience that this is mental health, and this is, if someone is having mental illness, will think about, you know, their thinking will be, will be vague, and it will be like, a, you will not understand how they think. Immediately this father got uh, uh, our attention, then he started asking questions. So my my son is doing this and this. Is this correct? We said no, it's not correct. And please bring him to the hospital. So we were using as much simple language as we can in order to reach the community to make people understand what is mental health. And I can say at that time, you know, most of the, uh, my generation, our father were illiterate. Majority of them they were not like educated, you know. So we were trying to to use a simple uh, omani uh, you know accent or omani you know arabic that we could reach to the to the people so that they understand what it is there you know it took us like for example 10 years in order for to, for the people to understand or to have fully insight about the mental health um let, let us take some uh, comments from our viewers as well uh, we have uh, Bilal again, our brother Bilal Afriqi. Masha Allah, sister, this is very good information, Wallahi. May Allah reward you. I have worked in mental health for 21 years in the UK and now in the Caribbean. I worked within, uh, within Muslim populated areas. Uh, and we also have from uh, Ahmed Al Matani, Love for Humanity. Masha Allah, Dr. Hamida, you are educating us about very important ideas and lessons. Um, we have a question as well from Ahmed Al Farsi that says, "How do we differentiate between a person with mental illness and a person with spiritual touch, like magic, envy, you name it?" So, uh, yeah. What what I can say about I can just describe about you know the mental health symptoms about the you know the spiritual thing. Some some of the people, it's not necessary that they're mentally ill. If they're extremely practicing their spirit, spiritual belief, but I can say that you know anything that you know will interrupt or will interfere your daily living in terms of thinking or your behavior or your emotion is considered to be a, a mental health issue. 
because you know to describe you as a mentally healthy is the way you relate to people the way you realize your abilities the way you cope with the stress the way you contribute to your community okay so if there is any interruption in these things means to say you are not ment mentally healthy so of course the people who are having like for example hallucination delusions and all these kind of symptoms they will not be living the normal life that anybody else is living they will not be contributing to their to their community they will not be living you know uh, uh, having the normal life with like anybody else who is doing they'll have problems with this, their social skills they will have problems with their you know the way they they think the way they you know they handle issues they handle stress so anything that is out of the line in the way you behave or the way you think or the way you you know you you handle your emotions it's considered to be a, a mentally issue so about spirituality things i cannot say much because i am not really <laughs> i'm not but, really uh, into that because the, uh -huh. the, dr hamida sometimes when you have a patient in the hospital and uh, you run all the tests and they seem to be normal but uh, sometimes if you can't explain what is wrong uh, with the patient because physically and through the test he looks like a normal person and he he has all the normal symptoms but he's still not acting in a normal way do do you refer them to further you know uh, treatment or do you send them away or what happens or have you come across such cases uh, actually that is a very good uh, comment or a question because i can say sheikh hatim you know in psychiatric or mental health we don't have any diagnostic machines we don't have any blood test that will tell you this particular person is having uh, schizophrenia we don't have any you know x-rays or you know lab that will you know will send the specimens there yeah. and they will come out that this is a positive schizophrenic case so it's all about our own judgment we as a profession so uh, for example a doctor a psychologist or a nurse you know it's about how is she really seeing the case or she's eval uh, how is she evaluating the case so we are the source of the you know the we are the diagnostic uh, machines that you know that we when we see the patient or when we we can we'll be able to re you know, to recognize that this is a purely mentally ill patient on how severe is the symptoms so it's about our judgment and the way we see we see the patient. So a lot of patients, you know, they'll come to us after, after they have been to many hospitals. They went they went to a lot of investigation, blood investigation. Physically, they're not, uh, you know, you know, they don't have anything. But it's the, about here. It's about the mind. It's about how they think, how they, you know, relate to, to people. It's about you know how you know how they handle their their emotions. So it's, this is where there will be a problem. So, and those things cannot be seen in any X-ray. So it's about how you judge. So most of the time, we have a set of, uh, for example, we have something called uh, uh, mental status examination. And that mental status examination, we have everything into, in, into that uh, form. So we see it, you know, the way the thinking, the thought, the memory, and, you know, the way you appear and you, you know, the way you relate to people. So all this set of questions will be able to tell us that where you are in terms of uh, your mental status okay but uh, if, if we, we, we talk about machines we don't have anything that you know uh, any diagnostic yeah. machine that will tell you this is a purely schizophrenic patient uh, but, but uh, with with your experience uh, yeah. will you uh, are you also able to do to know that without using any machines just by yeah uh, yes by looking at the yeah. person even doctors even psychiatrists themselves they don't they, they they don't use any machine so it's about their judgment and the way the, the patient come and exhibit the symptoms that he has so we have like for example criteria for example schizophrenia we have criteria like the patient have to have this set of symptoms for six mm -hmm. months so in terms for the doctor to diagnose him as a schizophrenic patient he have to exhibit these symptoms within this period non-stop for example six months he's having delusions or six months he's having hallucinations so at the end of the, you know, the doctor will evaluate since uh, since when this patient is suffering from this. From that judgment, then they will be able to say that okay, this is a manic case and this is a you know depressive case or this is a schizophrenic case. So we have a set of criteria that that we follow 
and we see if the patient is exhibiting those symptoms, then we'll be diagnosed as a certain uh, uh, disease. Dr. Hamida, uh, recently a lot of uh, students, especially uh, the ones that are sent abroad, they suffer from depression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are few cases where depression leads to committing suicide. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what is the main cause for students to be affected with depression? I think, in my opinion, uh, you know, the, the cultural, culture shock. So when they go, some, for example, they finish uh, the secondary school, they're just 18 years, then they will be mm -hmm. sent abroad somewhere where they, ha they were never been before. For example, spe especially people like, uh, you know, we, we know our, our tradition here in Oman, so it, we have like big families, extended families, we live with our cousins, we live with our brothers, you know, all the time we have like all the, the gatherings, so when they go there, they find themselves alone, okay? And sometimes, you know, because of the language barrier, because of, you know, maybe difficulty in, of the studies, they are not seeing their parents for a long time. So all these things will, will, trigger, uh, will trigger depression. And I can say that, you know, uh, majority of students, when they start to study, they have certain expectations. So they want like, for, uh, to meet that expectation. So when they started failing that, uh, meeting that their expectation because they want their parents, for example, to be proud of them, then later yes. on they feel that they are not doing well in school, especially in the first year, it will be very difficult for them. First of all, they, they have that, you know, they feel sad because they're alone, they have, you know, they are missing their parents, they are missing their friends, they are missing, missing a lot of things, you know. And uh, to handle the first year is really a challenging to all the students, you know, because after that, maybe you get used to the place, you get used to the people, you get used to the studies. And when, when you are doing well, you, you are, you are, you're okay. But when you are starting failing the subjects and, you know, going back and you're not doing well, you know, here yeah, maybe they are not even telling their parents that they are not doing well in the school. They can see only their, you know, the parents, can, they know that their children, they are in the school, they, they, they are doing well. And all these things, when they pile up, then later on, you know, it's, you know, it triggered depression, definitely. And majority of uh, the students, even in here in Oman, you know, sadly to say that suicide was one of the things which we never had among Omanis. But uh, recently, many have committed suicide among, among uh, students, is it? So what is the reason behind that? Is again about meeting the expectation. They are not really, you know, they are not, uh, you know, they don't handle the issue when it, it's, it's at an uh, early stage. So they wait yes. until, you know, everything is piled up, piled up, piled up, and they're not talking to anyone. And uh, I'm sorry to say, you know, sometimes we have counselors in the, in, the, in the schools and all, but even the student, they will not even approach the counselors to go and seek help. It, again, they consider that it, is, it would be a stigma to them, or maybe this counselor would come to know what is wrong with them, you know, they don't approach the counselor. So they will end up, you know, uh, having that severe depression, you know, absent in, this, uh, absent in the school, then they don't handle their projects, they don't handle their, their exams, and sometimes they even, I mean, I have heard that some of the students, they will be even, you know, terminated from the school, but they will remain to be in the, in, the, in the campus or near to the campus, they will not even tell their parents. So sometimes, you know, that are the things which will trigger depression. Majority of them, maybe they cannot go back to the, you know, for example, if she was a doctor or she was studying medicine and she was not doing well, she doesn't see herself below that. So what would what would be the next choice? The next choice is like, okay, let me just uh, finish my life. I will, I will not handle this anymore. But uh, I have heard that here in Oman, they, they put like a hotline for suicide. If anybody is having suicidal ideation, they can call and seek help. I don't know how far we have reached in that. Uh, this one. I'm how not sure how about practical that. is that? Because a person who wants to commit suicide, would he actually call? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if it, he is at the beginning, he is at the beginning having that, you know, sadness before having the suicidal thought. When he started becoming depressed, if he found himself that he can he can go somewhere or he can find someone who will help them, mm -hmm. definitely, they, you know, it can help. But when they start to become like suicidal and having suicidal thoughts and all these things, it is difficult. That's a good question. Sometimes they will not say. So they will uh, pursue their plan or they will go on or they will think how to really to do it here. 
But uh, you know, this this uh, help line could help the people who have like a, 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 a try to attempt suicide. Okay, so maybe if they will refer to them or maybe they they will know that there is a place that they could uh, seek help. Maybe they they will they will think of calling those numbers. Yeah. Uh, okay, D Dr. Hamida and maybe Hatim as well. Uh, if you can give advice to parents and students, what would that be to stop this from happening? And I'm talking about both Dr. the students, the doctors. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm talking about both uh, the parents and the students. Dr. Hamida will okay. give the advice. Uh, she's the specialist. I hope. I hope so. I hope really I can reach that advice. <laughs> Uh, I think, you know, communication is the most important thing, you know, uh, from the parent side, I think they should give the, uh, you know, the choice to their kids to see where are the, their potential. Because sometimes, you know, you find that the, the children are just, you know, taking their speciality or choosing any, 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 like, um, major or something. Uh, yeah, majors or according to their parents, uh, this one, <laughs> parents, uh, uh, you know, choice. needs or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, choice. Okay. So I think maybe the parents should be very open to their kids, try to understand that, you know, it's not everything that the parents, of course, we as the parents, we need to see our children, you know, and uh, that they have the best that they can. But we have also to understand that this is not 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 uh, always so because some of the children they have capabilities they have uh, they have their own potentials okay so give them the choice to choose what they have they want okay you can discuss with them you can guide them you can give them advice but don't force them to do something that they don't want to do and i think talking to their kids in a daily basis about what is happening with them in their school okay that would really help so much because sometimes when we, we get busy with our thing, we know that, okay, she's, she's already an adult. She can take care of, her, uh, of herself. We don't need to talk to her. She knows her way. No, she doesn't know her way. Maybe she has challenges. Okay. You as a mother, sit with your daughter and try to understand her. I, I'll give you an example of myself. You know, I used to see my daughter like, you know, uh, she, she's not as clever as I think. But when did I discover that? When I went to Scotland with her, when I went to Scotland with her, she was at, in the class 12. Class 12 means the secondary. So we went there. Like, that, uh, uh, yeah, 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 we were. Uh? Sanawiya, yeah. yeah. So we went there. So our plan was thinking that, okay, she will finish Sanawiya there and uh, she, will be, she will be able to join the college there. But when we went to Scotland, we went late. And uh, the. Omani government, they told her that she has to take certain majors in Scottish, uh, Scottish school in order to be recognized here as a Tanawi Amma. When we went to the, to the, to her school, when I went to her school and asked her about that, they told me, no, it's too late. She cannot take these majors because we came two months late. So we started wondering what to do. So is she going to really to lose this year? Then, uh, there was only one choice that she has to join Arabic, Arabic Tanawi. And uh, luckily, we found that Libyan uh, government, they are, you know, providing Arabic classes and they give Tanawiya. And uh, one of my friends told me that her daughter, she took Tanawiya uh, 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 Libya and she was able to join university here in, uh, in Oman. So my daughter told me that, Mama, I, I will not leave uh, the Scottish school, but I will be going to Arabic school. And my daughter was one of the girls which was going to private school and she never had sciences in Arabic. Mm -hmm. So what she, what what happened is that Libyan school was only teaching Arabic, all the sciences in Arabic. So imagine someone who never studied sciences in Arabic, and he's she's just joining in Tanawiya only to study sciences in That's Arabic. So that it's was challenging. really challenging. Yeah, I started thinking she will not make it at all. You know, but you know, I don't know. That was the time that I realized that I didn't understand my daughter all these years as a mom. I started mm -hmm. blaming myself, you know, and Alhamdulillah, luckily she, she made it and she passed the Tanawiya and she, she continued going to the Scottish school because she wanted uh, to learn something from them. She, she really liked the system there. She liked the teachers there, you know, because she's good in arts and she was doing a lot of things in school. Yeah. So she studied both Tanawiya in English and Arabic. <laughs> Mashallah. 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 Alhamdulillah. So that was one of the examples. Me as a mom, how did 
and I started even blaming myself, you know, all these years I didn't understand my, my daughter, and th that is my only daughter, you know. <laughs> so I, what I'm saying to the parents, try to understand your kids. They will have a lot of potential. They have a lot of things that they can show you. Don't pressurize them. Don't show them, you know, you know just, you know, guide them, facilitate what they want, and let them bring out what they, they can, and you will be really True. amazed with their potential. Very so true, that very and true. I'm telling uh, the student also don't you know don't keep quiet with mm. whatever issue that you are going through. Take anyone, not necessarily your mom. Take anyone whom you, you feel comfortable to talk with, mm. and talk. There is nothing you uh, know more than communication or talking when you want to get rid of any mental stress or something like that, because you don't want these things to pile up and you end up in the society. Uh, we will we will we will take some uh, comments from our uh, guests, but also I think I think uh, I'll do I'll do some kind of a commercial for Hatim. Uh, if you if you need <laughs> mental help, apart, <laughs> apart from Dr. Hamida, uh, I think you can also call Hatim. Ali, Ali, yeah. Ali, I'll start. I'll start charging you now. <laughs> Ali, Ali, as I said, I know Hatim before you. So I know that he can do that very well. No, no, no. You knew him only oh, wow. 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Mine goes back. <laughs> what, 30 years? But, uh, me, me and Ali, we know each other, I think, more than 30 years. Uh, yeah, no, he was hiding you from us. School. I don't know why. So, I don't know <laughs> why, Ali. So I didn't know that. I, I, I always <laughs> like to work behind the scene. Okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, so let so, us just take some comments before we ask yes. you the main question by Hatim, inshallah. I've noticed some teenagers aren't educated in how to deal with their emotions when uh, transitioning to college life. I wonder if there is a plan to introduce a class about handling emotions in school. Uh, so that was uh, actually a request uh, from... Uh, that that, that uh, Minister of Education will, will answer to that question. You, you, you got the answer, Ahmed. <laughs> <laughs> and we got from Salim Al Harthi, uh, wonderful work to help others with kindness, heart. God bless you and your family. Wish you all the best. And we also have uh, we got a few question uh, comments in here as well. Okay, again from uh, Salima. Uh, hope all population to understand that Ibn Sina Hospital and how to treat uh, patients in general. And now it's uh, what's the name of the hospital now? Al Masarat, right? No, Masarat, 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 yeah. Masarat, Masarat. Masarat, yeah. Masarat. Not, not Ibn Sina yeah. anymore. Uh, we got Ahmed Al Farsi saying, appreciate uh, you for all for this wonderful topic. Um, okay, as uh, Toki say, well said, Doctor uh, Hamida, MashaAllah. Uh, and we got a few more questions. Just, just a second, just a second. Uh, okay, uh, okay. There is a. Uh, Ahmed again, he wants advice. Please give advice to some counselor, counselors who might share students' private stories. Okay, I think. Uh, does, it, does he mean school counselors or. I believe it's about school counselors. I, I, th I, think, I think it's very rare that counselors uh, share uh, stories, uh, especially in details with names and things like that. Uh, I believe always in sharing stories uh, uh, anonymous, anonymously so people can benefit and uh, learn from them. But of <laughs> course, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. I but of I course, think... uh, you always uh, say the pro uh, confidentiality of the patient. You don't exactly. mention his name, you don't mention details, but Very for important. learning purpose, uh, it's, it's important to share stories. I think Hajit, the Hajit show says uh, something similar to that. Uh, should either stop doing that or quit the job. Because if counselors uh, that doesn't know how to keep clients secrets, they are not fit for the job. Yes, that is true. That is true. Uh, Hatim, I think before we move to uh, your question, I would like uh, Dr. Hamida to tell, us, to tell us the story that she told me the other day on the phone. About, uh, I wasn't uh, there. Okay. I wasn't there, so I don't know what story. Yeah. But, you know, uh, talking about that, I think uh, I want to talk about a little bit about my research, and uh, which was, uh, you know, <laughs> the main thing that uh, I felt that I am so honored 
to be in this channel and uh, you know i wanted some little bit of time to talk about my research actually and my research is uh, about uh, uh, you know drug addiction in oman and mm -hmm. um, i have conducted the research in a, a central prison in oman and uh, what it, that was looking uh, you know about uh, uh, exploring the, uh, you know, the relationship between life experiences uh, of drug abuse uh, both in prison and uh, outside prison and the contributing factors that are leading this kind of uh, this one, um, uh, drug addict or this category of people to go back to drugs within the very short time after release and um, the story which I have told uh, Ali is uh, um, among you know <laughs> one of the you know uh, I, I don't want to call patient but I can say that it's a victim she's a victim of addiction okay so my study actually was looking at the young Omanis who have been in prison and have been released uh, released in the prison and they went back to prison within a very short time so we know that here in Oman uh, you know uh, drug addiction is uh, sorry I can say that it is out of control you know, every day there are new cases. Every day we hear people in jail. Every day, every day we hear people who are, are, are dying because of drug overdose. So it became, to my definition again, I call it as a pandemic. It's there in every house, literally. Poor, rich, educated, not educated, you know, sheikh, not sheikh. Everybody now is, suffer, is complaining about the, uh, 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 drug addiction. And the saddest thing that we, nowadays we started seeing even female uh, you know, female uh, female are becoming female patient are becoming a, a drug addict, which was like very 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 rare. And in our custom in Oman and the tradition in Oman, the way we protect the lady and you know the the family how they protected their girls and their uh, you know, it's it's something which is, which I can say you know it's scary, because the story which I have told uh, Ali is about a girl who is really happened to be a victim of drug addict. Uh, drug abuse and uh, during the pandemic uh, sorry during the lockdown uh, during it uh, a mother of this girl called me that uh, her daughter is out of control and that time it was totally locked down and uh, she didn't know what to do she didn't know where to take her daughter actually she called me previously and they guided her to take her to the hospital and the girl went to the hospital but she signed against medical advice and she was uh, you know she went back home so during this uh, this time, the girl became out of control, and she was like uh, going out of the house. She became a source of abuse. I, you know, definitely it will be sexual abuse because she was searching for money to buy drugs. And the mother called me. She was literally crying. She didn't know what to do. And I told her, please, uh, you know, because uh, the the symptoms which she, she told me, she, it was uh, totally showing that she's having also mental health mental uh, health issues. So I advised the the, son, the mother to to uh, uh, restrain the girl because she was going out of, of the house and you know she stayed like uh, four or five hours without uh, the mother didn't know where she went and uh, you know I think it was a late night when someone just came and dropped her at home. And then uh, they were able to restrain the girl and they took her to the hospital. Uh, it, you know. Surprisingly, that the hospital they didn't receive the, the the girl. They said that you know last time she signed without medical advice or the protocol of the hospital, it, she should be admitted after six months. But the condition, how the girl was, you know, the, you know, she was literally out of her mind. She needed someone to protect her. The mother is alone. She's divorced. She's having other children. She couldn't control the girl at home. I think this girl should be. They should. The hospital should have kept her at least. For the purpose of protecting her from whatever yeah. was going was going on with her, but I was surprised that the girl was returned back, and the mother is telling the way we took her, restrained her, and the way we put her in the car by force, and we took her to the hospital with that all that effort that we did, and they they turned us back. They didn't receive the patient, the the, uh, the patient. So they told her that you have to come during the working day. So that was like uh, Thursday, Thursday thing, and the working was working day was like. Uh, Sunday. Sunday. This, Sunday. Yeah. So the second day also, you know, they put the girl in the room. They try to close the door because, you know, the mother is saying, you know, I don't know. I cannot really control this situation because once they open the door, she runs out of the house. 
And if I tell you the story of this girl, you'd be, su you'd be surprised because she's an educated girl. She was having an abusive marriage before this marriage. And it happened that she married a, a drug addict and she, this man is the one who really pulled her leg into this uh, condition. And um, after I did, I, I, called the, I called the mother to find out what happened. Then it seemed that they took the girl to the hospital with a lot of uh, wasta, I can say, mm. not the protocol again. They put they put the girl in the hospital. Sad. The same scenario happened again. The girl signed against a medical advice. So the mother is telling, I was uh, I was at home mm -hmm. just one day. I was at home thinking that my daughter is in the hospital, and I could hear someone is knocking the door. When she went to open, the girl is in the door. So they released the girl again, you know, without even her parents knowing that they are going to discharge the patient. So that was something which really I thought even I'm going to talk to the hospital management if mm. you know they have really to do something about that. But, Come but on, Tara, if, I just wanted I just wanted to ask you if this mm -hmm. girl is mental mentally unstable, how can she sign a document? No, no, they, they put do, why, her in, dra why? in drug unit. They put her in drug unit. But uh, so how, this, how, this, what, what is this, what the doc document says? What 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 does it do? This document, if she signs, the document is related to all the, the drug drug addiction, only the uh, drug addiction patient. So they have the protocol in the drug unit that anyone who comes to the hospital and he turns out against medical advice, he will not be admitted until six months. If he finish six months, then he can come. He, he will be eligible to for admission. Ah, okay. So that is the protocol for drug addiction patient because. To them, that the drug addiction are very manipulative, and you know they can just sometimes when they run out of the police, and then they come to the hospital. They say one day, or well, the case is it finished. They, say, they they go back home. So I think mm -hmm. that is that was the reason why they have applied that rule. But in her condition, it was different. She was a girl. She needed someone to protect her. Yeah. Okay, she needed to you know. And the way the mother is telling, she's totally out of her mind. It's not only drugs because you know, she was like uh, having hallucinations. She was seeing things, and she was like. Uh, screaming, even she was, sorry to say, she was pooping in her dress. So that was something that she really needed a medical attention. And I was surprised to see that they just released her and let her go home. This is really this sad. Is, I think, I think, I think it, has to, it has to change. And I think uh, if anybody is hearing from, from that side, uh, you have to change. You have to accept mm -hmm. that th there should be exceptions. You know, if, okay, it's good to have yes. rules based on uh, whatever experience you've gone through, but that shouldn't apply to everybody. You have to analyze yeah, the person. I, yeah, yeah. So I, if, if I go back again to my research, this, my yeah. research was lo uh, yeah, looking at the people who have been like uh, the drug addicts, only the, those who are using drugs, uh, sorry, not, uh, they're not involved in any other crimes. So, and those who have been like uh, having multiple uh, re-entry in the prison and you know, I think Oman, they wanted to control drug addiction, and so they applied a very strict penalties for those who, have, who will be caught and they will be, uh, you know, re jailed again. So mm -hmm. in order to do that, they, like, uh, you know, the, the, the punishment was, it was so strict, but the amazing thing is that the number of drug addiction, uh, the addicts who are going back to prison were even more than before. Okay, so you find that someone is out of jail, six months, two months, three months, they're, again, they're in the jail. So they wanted to control that, that they found, but uh, unfortunately, they found that there are many people who are going back to prison, even after that uh, strict rule. So my study was to investigating what are the contributing factors which are letting this category of people going back to jail, or sorry, going back to drugs, regardless of knowing that there will be uh, the, the rules of, or the penalties will be stricter than before. So I started investigating and, and uh, I studied the life experiences in the jail. So what is happening when a drug addict is in the jail? And what is happening when the drug addict is out of the jail? And what are the contributing factors that are letting them to go back to drugs and go to the jail? So the finding of my study, it was like uh, the life, uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, divided in four dimensions. One dimension was looking at the life experiences in jail. And the second dimension is when they come out and they go and face their families and their community, so what is happening? Then the uh, third dimension was looking at the impact of prison on these people. And the fourth dimension was about contributing factors to uh, early relapse. 
So I, what I can say uh, about my findings, so the first dimension, I really learned a lot of things which is happening in the game. So they think that way, if they put a drug addict in, sorry to say, say they, I, I mean, whatever it is applied in Oman or the government. So they, they think that, you know, if they put a drug addict in jail, he will be like, uh, he will stop using drugs or he will stop like uh, doing whatever he, he does. But unfortunately mm -hmm. to say that they are even teaching him to become a better addict when he's in the jail. Because based yeah. on the, my, the findings which I found that in the jail itself, they, they have a lot of things that they are, uh, they, are, uh, they are facing and they are changing their identity completely. So you put an addict in the jail, he, he was having a, one problem which was, it was addiction, but when he comes out, out of the jail, he will be having another problem. So rather than dealing with one problem, which was addiction after, after release, they will be dealing with addiction, plus they will have either physical or mental illnesses or issues. So he be, he comes out of the jail, and he is a completely com completely different person. So in the jail, what happens when they go in the jail? So they describe to me that when they when we go to the jail, at the uh, you know they suffer for something called entry shock. So regardless of how many times they have been in the jail, all of the prison prisoners they suffer for something which is called entry shock. First of all, when these people are caught and kept in the jail they will stop the you you're, of course they'll be you know they'll be uh, they'll be uh, they'll caught they'll be caught because they're using drugs so maybe the the person was using drugs two days before or three days before so when he is placed in the jail he has to stop drugs uh, drugs abruptly so when he goes in the jail during the first week what is happening first of all he lives in denial then he started getting withdrawal symptoms and he will be like uh, of course, the one, they will not take him to the clinic immediately because he's having withdrawal symptoms. He will be suffering with those, the physical symptoms and the psychological symptoms of withdrawal because he has stopped abruptly. So they don't, like, for, sorry to say, they don't look at the people who are using drugs, what happened to them if we put them in the jail or during the first week or second week. Definitely, majority of them will be suffering from withdrawal symptoms. And those withdrawal symptoms are a group of symptoms, physical symptoms, which is really annoying. They'll be having pain, joint pain, they'll be vomiting, they'll be having headaches. So what uh, the maximum that the, the prison will provide them is just maybe analgesic, which is maybe Panadol or something like that. So they suffer from entry shock. The majority of them, they say, when we go to the jail, we, we suffer from something called uh, this amnesia, which is uh, loss, uh, loss, uh, loss of memory. And most of the time, it is like short-term memory. They forget everything about about their the short memory. The majority of them, they say, we live in a fantasy. We don't want to, we li they live in denial that they're in the jail. So they mm. started, you know, fantasizing their own life. They started hearing uh -huh. voices. They started, you know, you know, until they adjust, it takes them time. And the adjustment itself, adjustment itself, it's a totally different story because each different, each uh, individual is different. And the way they, they handle the adjustment is totally different. Some of them, they adjust, with the jail life, maybe one week, two weeks, and they're okay. But some of them, they stayed until you know they come out. They still did not. They still did not adjust in jail. Another thing which I found that uh, the life in jail is, you know, they create a network exactly the same network of what they have outside. So they put all drug addicts together. So the dealers are there. They, you know, the consumers are there, and you know they have. Sorry to say, the drug deals sometimes happen even inside the jail. Okay, so the same network, which is outside, it will be even inside the jail. Okay, so that is another thing which they, uh, they, this one they suffer. Another thing is like, uh, the third thing is like boredom. Boredom nowadays because of human rights, okay, no any prison is forced to do any activity. They can do whatever they want, you know, if they don't want to do this, they, 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 they just stay in their wings. So that has brought a very negative impact on them because most of the time they are sitting, okay? either fighting or, you know, all the noises or staying in the, like one small place, a big number of people. Okay, so they, you know, you know, started creating that criminal mind and, they, you know, they become disturbed, they become in physical and emotional, you know, they cannot really handle that particular thing. If they try to go and, uh, the, uh, you know, the central jail, you know, mashallah, it's a, it's a very big, uh, you know, institution, 
it has a lot of things, you know, a lot of recreational activities. But some of the prison prisoners, they choose not to go to, to participate because it's optional. So when they go to participate, some of their, their, their colleagues or their people there, they start doubting that they're working with the police. So they will be, what, they, what will happen? They will put themselves at risk. At risk. So what they will do, they will do, they will choose not to go. Okay, so most of the time they, they complain about boredom. Another thing which is uh, in their life, uh, this one, in, in prison life, is, uh, you know, the gangs and the groupings, it's the same as if they're outside. So all drug addicts, they intend to be one group. In that one big group, there is small groups, there is small community. So there are, uh, you know, le leaders, there are followers, there are, you know, someone who is who needs to be disciplined, they, they can Five or six, they can even beat one someone. You know, we have we that here. Like a, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm talking about central jail in Somalia. Okay, so I this uh, only happens. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah. no, believe me, prison is prison. Wherever it is in the world, it's the same mentality, same, same everything. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Another thing, another the last thing, which is in the life of uh, uh, drug addicts in prison, is about uh, uh, getting the disease. Prison itself yeah. could be a cubic of communicable and non-communicable disease. So majority of them, they come out with a chest infection, with the, you know, of course, they'll get it. You know what I mean about, you know, the yeah. relationship and all, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, hepatitis is very common, especially with drug addicts. Even before they go to jail, majority of them, they already have the, uh, the hepatitis, all the hepatitis, B or C or something like that. So they yeah. come out. If you know they come out of the jail, apart from their addiction, they have already you know the, this communicable, non-communicable disease. So these are the uh, you know if I have to describe the life of, of an addict in prison, it this this is the way it is. So there is no way that you can say that you are putting someone there to stop drug or to quit drug because whatever they learn in prison about drug is even greater from whatever they learn here outside the prison. Because everybody is there, everything is available, but, and they can hear, but, they can learn from each other. But Dr. Hamida, let, let, let me interrupt you a little bit. When yeah. it comes to 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 drugs, mm -hmm. there there are two there are two types. Someone who is uh, consuming drugs, he might be a civilian. Yeah. yeah. And someone someone who is a criminal, who is dealing in drugs, who is mm. smuggling, who is stealing. So these are two different things. Now, mm -hmm. if we don't put them in prison, what should be the right place for them to be for, for both two, two different uh, segments of drug uh, uh, addicts? Yeah. To me, uh, you know, the one who was uh, smuggling drugs, I, I don't even want to talk about that because they deserve jail. Because these mm -hmm. are the people who are hurting other people. These are the people who are killing, and not even hurting, they are killing other people. Okay, so you cannot really compare and put them in one category because they are not at yeah. all in one category. And surprisingly, I can tell you, Sheikh Hatim, this kind of, you know, the smuggler, smugglers, most of the time they are not addicts. Mm. They don't use drugs. So they sell drugs, but they don't use, majority of they them, don't they use don't use drugs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so they are very smart to, you know, to protect themselves. Okay, so you, we cannot put them at the same categories of those who are using drugs. What I'm, I'm, I'm advocating, I'm advocating those who are using drugs without even in being involving in any other crime. Because, you know, again, we can say that, you know, maybe drug, maybe drug addiction can teach them to do a lot of crimes in order to fulfill their needs and to get drugs. So what I'm yes. advocating, and that is the majority of prisoners which I have, uh, I have uh, met in prison, they have just be in jail because they were just using drugs, even or they maybe the the possession was for their own consumption, not even for 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 like for selling. So I yes. can advocate only those who are using drugs, and they are helpless. These people they want people to help them. They, we cannot put all the blame to on these people because in the first place they will not be addicts if they are not having a personality issues. If they don't have like uh, they are people who are like you know. They fall maybe in they're, they're, they're victims. Maybe they're victims. They're victims. Majority yeah, of yeah. them are victims. They will tell you that they have started, you know, that teenager period when they started exploring and trying everything. They didn't mm. know even the consequences of this. So why to blame them? 
Okay, so we cannot really put the blame on them. What we can do is to help them, help them come out of this pandemic, what they call in my definition. Okay, so if I have to talk about the second uh, dimension of my findings, it was when they come out of the prison. So they come out of the prison, they go to their parents, stubborn the parents, oh, my son has been corrected. And as the, the participants called, they said, you know, they considered us as Sheriff Makkah. Oh, he's good now, he has been disciplined and he's okay, now he's ready to come. They don't know that the person whom they sent in the first place is totally different from whom they are seeing now. Mm. Okay. The, the, so he the can, first thing, the, the first thing they do, they give him a wife. Yeah, there you are exactly. It's not only a wife. <laughs> you know, during the first week, when they, they they come out of jail, all the aunties and the cousins and Maraf kill had everybody will be bombarding him with the advices. See, now you can, you are okay, you are good. You know, you can do this. You can. No one is even is bothering to ask him. How do you feel? How are you? How yeah. like you? Well, they see him like Khalas. He has been brand new. He has been corrected, you know, service and you know, he's, brand new. He's, a, he's, a, new, no he's a newborn. Newborn. Yeah, he's a newborn. Yeah. <laughs> see, the, it's, oh. uh, actually the opposite of that. Okay. Mm. So when after one week exactly from their release, from their release, they started. From, uh, after one week from their release, then uh, once everybody goes back to one, to mind their own business, what will happen? There will be an emptiness. They don't know what to do, okay? So, khalas, the father is busy, everybody is busy, okay? They left alone. So, expecting him that he can do magic, okay? Okay, go find job, go find this, go find that. Then after one month exactly, when the father realized that, okay, he's not really going to work or he's not finding job, everybody will start turning against him, okay? Blaming him, okay? And then, you know, family issues will start, you know, stigmatizing themselves, you know, the, fa the father cannot go to the community, you know, they cannot go approaching pe people, they start stop coming to their house. Mm -hmm. Father and mother fighting because the mother is, you know, sympathizing with their child, the father is too strict with their, you know, it's, it's a chaos, okay? But what I can say, again, it's mismanagement and, uh, it, you know, drug addicts, it's, an, uh, it's a burden, it's, it's something that has come to your life. We have to embrace that and to understand this is it's not because of their fault. It's us how to learn how really can we embrace our kids, you know, uh, accept it as it is a challenge to you as a parent rather than putting a blame on him. Okay, so in, in terms of family taban, there are a lot of things which I have found. I cannot describe it all here. Okay, so when they go to the community, community is rejecting them. When they go to find jobs, they have blacklisted it because they have been in jail for two years. They have to be like free, oh, like yeah. you know, for this one. They cannot find jobs. They cannot find like a, Alhamdulillah here in Oman, you don't have something like homeless. You know, when they come out of jail, there is someone will take them, either parents or family or mother. They'll be having somewhere to go. But outside there, you know, according to literature, majority maybe will be homeless. But here, Alhamdulillah. Yeah. But what are we doing really when we we receive our, our loved ones once they come out of jail? our responsibility okay mm -hmm. so the third dimension was talking about the impact of jail on them so what had happened what what does the jail happen uh, did to them so you will find them that you know they have become sick physically sick psychological sick they have lost their identity they become like uh, they develop uh, ag you know aggression behavior they cannot they cannot relate to others they cannot handle daily life okay they they were not prepared to come out and live the stress of the new life which they have. Okay, so the fourth dimension was talking about uh, what are the contributing factors which are, let, uh, you know, letting them to go back to drugs. That, again, I found a lot of things I can just summarize in two things. One of it is about how legal system is dealing with them here in Oman. I can say that majority of drug addicts, when they come out, uh, out of jail, they will assign uh, a cover detector. Okay, so detector mm. will be following them everywhere. So, and, and, and all of them, they know about it, okay? So you find that the drug addict, when he comes there, the most thing that they will be feeling is about the detector who are following them. Yeah. Okay, rather than signing a detector, signing a counselor, signing to them a counselor yeah. or a social worker who will help them to yeah, find exactly. job. Or, yeah, yeah. Rather than, you know, putting the pressure in, uh, making the, these people living in hell, they're really living in hell. We think that they, you know, say he has been out of jail, but within two months he have, have gone back to. You're adding, to you're adding more, what? more burden to him. 
yeah, what are the reasons which have led this young man to go back in jail? So the thing which I want to mention here is that once you put a drug addict in, in, in jail, he will never come out of that circle. It will be life jail, life, you know, uh, you know, outside, inside, outside, inside. So the same circle. And the most of the time that he leaves, it will be outside, it will be inside the jail. Because he lived yeah. there three years, he comes out six months, he go back two years, he comes back, you know, this will be the, the circle. So, and the more on, damage, the uh, more the, damage will come. Mm-hmm. On the same on the same topic, there's a question by Ahmed. Uh, he said, uh, I wonder if you're sharing these scary findings with the officials. If yes, how was the response? I have just graduated <laughs> from the, mm-hmm. my PhD and I have actually met uh, one of the, uh, I can say, authoritative, uh, you know, uh, person. Um, and he promised me that we'll be talking after that. And uh, he, and I, we did not really uh, start and talk much about it, but he promised me that, you know, once I'm done with the, uh, he was going on leave and he said, uh, I was going also for my graduation, which, uh, and I told him once I come back, then we can talk about it. But I tried, I, I started disseminating the findings. I conducted the, uh, this one, a presentation in Al Masara Hospital where most of the doctors were there and they heard me. And uh, I also put, uh, put in the newspaper so that the community knows that this is what is happening. So my recommendations were actually, again, divided into long term and short term recommendation. The first recommendation that I would like, if you are really Putting people in jail, especially the drug addicts, there should be a rehabilitation center in the, in the jail that will rehabilitate this, these people, will prepare them to go, when they go out of jail, what to do, okay? And the, the second thing is they have, uh, in most of the literature and the, with the findings which I found in the majority of the European countries, they have applied something called tre- drug treatment in prison. So there is a mm-hmm. center of drug treatment inside the prison. Okay, mm-hmm. there is no harm if you want to put them in jail, but provide with, uh, to them something that which will be helpful. Okay, yeah. Pro, you know, put centers which like, uh, uh, for example, uh, 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 things which will teach them something to work on, hands on, you know, let them, you know, uh, discover their potential. Like, like, a, skill, in the jail. like a skill. Yeah, like a skill, yes. Yeah. I met one of the, the, the prisoners and I was so impressed about that he have discovered that he can draw very well, very, very well. And he did not know that he has that potential while he was not, he was, uh, he was, at, he was at home. So he mm-hmm. discovers his potential there in the jail. So why can't we really develop this, their, their skills and help them bring out their potentials, okay? And see where they, they go. So for example, if he has, he has, he have learned something in the jail, he has, for example, uh, mehna or whatever it is, a profession. So, you know, uh, there should be a system that is helping him when he goes out of the jail, whom to approach in order to continue whatever he has learned, or who or what uh, kind of uh, work he can do outside the jail, okay? Give them something to work on. Don't make it optional. Make it uh, compulsory. So everybody will be forced to go and do. Because if you leave anything compulsory, especially the option, especially in, in prison, no one is going to work or no one is going to do anything. Okay. That's right. So uh, yeah, that w- was the short term. Uh, this one uh, recommendation. The long term recommendation is that you know we should have like uh, a network or sorry a system that is uh, where the Ministry of Social uh, Development is involved, where the police is involved, where the you know Ministry of Labor is involved. Okay, Minister of Health also. So there should be a system that you know the drug addict knows that if I want a job, I know where to where where to to go or whom to who where can I seek help? Who are the people who could help me? If I want a counselor, I know where to go. If I want a, a you know uh, uh, any kind of treatment, I can say we have we have this new hospital which is Al Masara Hospital. But how many beds do do we have? We have only fifty beds for drug addicts. 25 for rehabilitation and 25 for detox. So it, it compared to the number of uh, drug addicts which are available are here in Oman, and those who only who have registered, there are a lot of drug addicts who are not registered. I think now maybe by now maybe we have 20,000, which is not reflecting the real number of, uh, of drug addicts in Oman. So I think we should have really a system which have 
we you know where we we make the drug addicts themselves approach the system rather than you know terrifying terrifying them with the uh, people who are hunting them you know just leaving them to face their own challenges is these are people who are really helpless we should help them another thing is that they should be like a little bit like incentive when they come out of jail because majority of them they said you know we come out of jail even we are not entitled to go to ask for rather than uh, 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 benefit or something that would help them to start their life some of them they have even family the families maybe the family of a drug addict who, are, who have been in prison will be supported by the government only for maybe for six months then after six months they will live and stop the, the you know helping the family of addict so uh, you know thinking that an addict who have been in prison will by that time he'll find a job come on where is he going to find a job if he's in blacklisted yeah. he's not he's not going to no no one will, will be accept, nobody's, accept, nobody's accepting him to. yeah so oh, no. let us not to put the blame to the drug addicts only let us do our job first i i know that you know the government has done a lot you know they have uh, they know, and there are a lot of sponsorship which is, people have really contributed they are building the halfway houses but if we don't really go to their level and understand from their pr perspective what can we do to help you get them involved in their own decision of uh, quitting the drugs and making them to become better individuals in the community we are not doing anything even if we build a lot of buildings you know you know fancy buildings and you know putting them giving them uh, putting them there with their with our condition but once they come out so what 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 is there so what uh, what is next so we should be thinking about what is next about this category of people we should not just letting them you know swim in the ocean some of them majority of them they are dying because of drug addiction so because of drug overdose just recently two two days back one guy died because of drug overdose. How many have died because of drug overdose? And mm -hmm. I can say the might of mental health is still even with a drug overdose. If anyone dies with drug overdose, even the, people are not even attending their funerals. They think oh, he deserves to die because he was a drug uh, addict. No, he doesn't deserve that. The family doesn't deserve to be stigmatized because he was having a drug addict kid. No, no one deserves that. So I think really we should really work hard we should even investigate, you know, I, sorry to say, you know, even people who are drunk because of drug overdose, you know, even the sometimes it's not necessary that they have themselves, they have injected themselves. Maybe it is a murderer. Maybe someone have killed him. You know, sometimes they kill, you know, among the, the dealers and all someone, if you're not complying with them, they may kill him. But yes. because the family is afraid to be stigmatized, what will happen? They'll just take their, their son and bury him. No, there should be an investigation. You know, they should get their full right as any individual. Why you have to put all the load on a drug addict? No, it's not. Then it's not their fault to become a drug addict. It happened that their destiny became uh, became like that. But that is not their fault. Like if an, a cancer patient is not her fault or she, uh, his fault to become a cancer patient and his destiny is to die. Yes. It's the same thing with a drug addict. So we should really keep, uh, you know, all of us, you know, unite in order to help our drug addict uh, members. And that's all what Dr. I can say about my study. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Hamida, thank you very much uh, for your insight. I would say that this is one of the sessions that we really uh, benefited. It was very touchy. It's a very sensitive uh, topic. And one of the things that really touched me that uh, you didn't only go and get educated in this area, but you yes. also concerned now that you came back, you want to solve the problem. Yeah, and people like you are the ones who are going to solve the problem because it takes mm -hmm. initiatives of people who are brave, who believe in what they do to change the reality of their society. So yeah. I wish you all the best, uh, Dr. Hamida, and we support you all the way. And we hope one day uh, we will see you successful in solving the problems of drug addiction in Oman and to introduce modern ways to resolve these issues bi idhnillahi ta'ala jazakallah khair dr shukran shukran i would like to thank you both of you and the audience and all those who have put comments and uh, i hope that i have reached the information to you all yeah. and uh, the last thing that i can say please i want to say this and uh, my mm -hmm. thesis is actually and my hard work and my uh, all the difficulties which i have spent 
four years to do in, in, in doing my PhD. Uh, this thesis and this hard work is dedicated to all young Omanis who are victims of drug addiction and those who have died Anna. because of, of drug overdose. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, I think I think as as Brother uh, Hatim mentioned, uh, inshallah your study will not go in vain. And I think this is how we should always be. You know, when when whenever we study something, is how you apply it there, how you can help the community. And mashallah, you're doing yeah. a very great job. And uh, and inshallah, inshallah, I think this. I hope this message, uh, you know, gets received by the officials and uh, and and uh, I don't know wherever it can go, wherever it can go, and changes should happen. At, uh, inshallah, at, I I hope in, so. inshallah. Yeah. Maybe not immediately, but it might. It might take time, but inshallah, step one step at a time, and it will happen. Inshallah. 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 May, may, may Allah put this uh, effort in your reward as Hassan as Sadaqah Jari, inshallah, Amen. and you find this reward in the hereafter. Bismi Allah Taala. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamida. Please take care of yourself, and if you ever need anything from me and Ali, we're here to support you. Thank 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 you. MashaAllah. See, Hatim, now, you know, I love this show more and more and more because of, you know, what we are trying to do and what how we're trying to help community yes i think uh, it's very important uh, people to have passion in what they do and to support their community and society and it's not about the the piece of paper that you get yes. as a qualification it's what you do with it that really matters and uh, today uh, dr hamida has you know demonstrated how someone can be pa- so passionate and so concerning and so loving uh, to her community that she would go beyond the means to make a difference. Um, and today, honestly speaking, it was very educational for me. Yeah. A lot of the things that she has mentioned, I did not know. And I'm mm-hmm. sure it's going to help me uh, in the work I do also for my society. May Allah reward her and reward everyone out there who is doing a wonderful job. Ameen, Ameen, Ya Rabbi Alameen. I would like to even thank our viewers uh, who have asked a very wonderful questions and uh, comments. And, uh, and, and hopefully that will also not go in vain, inshallah. So thanks for your participation. And uh, your participation will uh, not be enough if you do not. <laughs> Hatim, want to say that? <laughs> <laughs> Share, like, and subscribe, and hit the indication button. Yes. Did I get it right? Yes, man, you got it right <laughs> this time. So, yeah, and with that, I think uh, this is the end of the show, inshallah. So, as alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Hayyak. Alaikum salam.